And since Super Squad, you guys may go ahead and head out at this time. <laughs> Tried to catch you before you see them. My bad. So good evening. I'm so happy to see everyone tonight. I hope you had a wonderful week. If I haven't talked to you in the interim, um, I did. I caught an inshore slam yesterday. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it is uh, three species of fish that you have to catch on the same trip to be able to consider it a slam. It was amazing. Um, we beat the rain, so it was a, just a great trip. You know? So tonight we are going to jump back into Acts chapter 6. Um, we're, we're looking at the continuation of how the church is starting to function. Okay, so remember last week we talked about we're moving out of that focus of the birth of the church, like the church has been born. Um, they, they are growing and growing. We keep seeing that, and they increase, and they increase, and they increase. And so what we're going to be starting to see now is this adolescent kind of church, this church that now is going to start having problems that, that just come with having people gathered together because as some of us know like the more people you get together in one spot the more problems that are going to wind up coming it's going to be too hot it's going to be too cold it's going to be too loud it's going to be too soft it's going to be all of these different things because we have these pains and we call them growing pains but it's a good pain to have to go through most of the time but we're going to pick up where we kind of left off it's a, there's a little bit of overlay um so I will pray and we will jump into that. Father, we thank you for your word and, and God for your church. God, we thank you for your bride that, that you have established. And we just ask and we pray, Father, that as we go through tonight, that I just be a vessel you work through. And Father, you speak to your people. And even though it might be my voice, people hear it as your words cutting to our heart. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up in verse 3. And verse 3 starts like this. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Um, so, so just a little refresher from last week in case you missed it or in case you, you know, it kind of slipped your mind. Remember, this chapter started with the Hellenist we're coming to the apostles and they were going, hey, look, we are, our widows aren't being cared for. Okay, the Hellenists, for those of you who may not be familiar with that term, are the Greek-speaking Jews. So these are, are Jews who have converted to, to Christianity, but they, they spoke Greek instead of the Hebrew and Aramaic of, of the Israelites, okay? So again, a lot of these were, were people who were living very far off, who have come back to Jerusalem at, at some point in their lifetime. They have converted to Christianity. They have placed their faith in Jesus, and they went, hey, look, like our widows are being neglected. Honestly, if we were to go through that, we could talk about, you know, racism as far as this is concerned. We could talk about, you know, discrimination and, and things of that nature because they kind of had this tiered system going on. Like the Hebrews were, were the more pure of the, the Christians and then, and then the Greeks, the Hellenists, would have been on a lower level tier. And the apostles, though, however... When they see that this is an issue, here's what they don't do. They didn't go, okay, we need to put this to a vote. Like, we, we all need to come together and, and vote on this. They, they didn't go, hey, we need to form a committee and we need to brainstorm decisions and, and how we can do this. Okay, they didn't sit here and go with, with our famous line, right? Well, let's pray about it and let's see what the Lord leads us to. Like, no, they jumped in. They went, hey, no, like, there is an issue. It's a valid issue. Remember last week we did talk about not all complaints we hear are going to be valid issues, but this is a valid issue. So they, they, they gather the whole number and they go, hey, pick from yourselves seven men of good repute and full of the Spirit and of wisdom. So the apostles jump in and they go, hey, we see this problem. Here is our solution. 
We're going to continue to function in the role that God has called us to function in this thing we call the church. But what we're going to do is we're going to create new positions and we're going to raise up new people so that they can function in the roles that God is creating in his church for them to serve in. This, by the way, is the whole thought process behind Mission Sent. It's creating this umbrella organization that allows people the opportunity to work under a 5013C in their passion. Okay, your passion may not be my passion. Looking out at the crowd, I know that your passion is probably not my passion because most of you, none of you clapped when I said I caught an inshore slam yesterday. No, you can't clap if I ask for it. That's cheesy. Basically, what that means is you are either a hater, Eric because you're the only other one in the room that knew what that was, or you didn't know what it was because we share different passions. And see, remember last week, I, 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 at the end, I challenge you, start thinking about your passions. What are the things that make you tick, and how can we do those things for the glory of God? See, what the apostles are doing here is they're going, hey, remember we, we talked a bunch last week about roles and functions and the apostles are going hey we have a function to do we need to create space for others to serve in this thing too okay and it's interesting to note some of the things uh here and 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 see where we find them in other places throughout scripture okay so when the apostles are going hey pick seven among you they don't go just randomly pick seven people They go pick seven men from among you who are full of the spirit and of wisdom. Like there are qualifications that go with serving in this role. So for instance, they say men of good repute, okay? In church planning, one of the first things that they talk about when when you're looking to identify future church planters is the biggest thing you look for is their character, not their charisma, In other words, there are people who are very, very, very gifted and being able to stand up in front of a room and and your attention's just kind of drawn to them, right? So think like kind of just like the opposite of what you see every Saturday night. Like there are people out there like that, that you just can't help but like you, you hang on their every word because they have charisma. You know who had a lot of charisma throughout history? who got a whole country to follow him into some really evil and wicked things? Hitler. Like, just because you have charisma, just because people will be, like, looking at you doesn't mean where you're leading them is going to be a good place. So they focus a lot on the character of the planter and not as much as the charisma of the planter. So, in other words, a person can be taught how to properly study the Bible. There are lessons, it's called homiletics, okay, it's a whole class you got to take in seminary that teaches you how to prepare and deliver a sermon, okay? It's public speaking, it's speech class, it's not the hardest thing you'll ever do. Like, there are ways to teach these skills But character is just who you are as a person, right? Like character are the values and the morals that you hold to. Character is going, hey, I know they're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Not because there's people watching them, not because of all of this. Character is who you are. See, that's why there's so many churches that fall, like, and you see them all the time in the news, In fact, depending on what streaming platforms you use nowadays, because nowadays it's just as bad as having cable. Um, Like, I miss the days when it was just Netflix. However, I do love Disney Plus, and we don't even have Netflix, so do with what, what you will. But anyway, there are shows on all of these streaming platforms that follow these mega churches who have these horrific falls. Because again, we get so wrapped up in what the person looks like, the attributes the person's bringing to the table, that we, we kind of throw that good repute thing out of the window. In fact, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 13, Paul lays out the qualifications for overseers and deacons within the church. Okay, and, and if you go through there, he says a lot. I was going to read it all, but like I'm not a fast reader and I didn't want to take 
all of the time to read it, so I'm just going to pull out a couple. He says that they must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, not a drunkard, self-controlled. He says that they must not be recent converts. In other words, it can't be someone who just came to believe in all of this. He said they must be hospitable. They must not be um, quarrelsome. In other words, they, they, you know, they shouldn't be. That one's kind of hard for me because sometimes I, I find myself being quarrelsome, right? Not for the sake of arguing, but, but going, hey, like, if this is true, it, it matters, and we need to get to the, to the truth of the matter. Okay, but, but what he's talking about is he's going, hey, they have to have these things. Yes, he does include in there they must be able to teach, okay, but he does not focus on the person's abilities, but rather their character. So when we go through and we see the biblical qualifications to be a pastor, to be a deacon, what we see, again, is character, is good repute. Are they an upstanding person? Because, again, and Paul would word it like this in 1 Timothy 3, if they can't lead their household, how are they going to lead the church of Jesus? And that's good. Like, those make sense, right? Does anybody in here, like, on the surface go, you know what, I disagree with that kind of thought. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, they could be a bad leader at home, but be a good leader here. No one? See, I give you guys opportunity to talk all the time, and no one does. But for most of you sitting in this room, you're probably thinking something along these lines. Yeah, that's cool. Like, I get there are qualifications to be an elder in the church of Jesus or a deacon in the church of Jesus, but I am neither, and I don't aspire to be either. I get you. I understand where you're coming from. The problem with that thought process, though, is Scripture. Because in 1 Peter 2.9, it would argue this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we all just sang that, right? I came out of the grave. So Peter is sitting here arguing, hey, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you're called to do everything that I am doing right now. You are called to be able to preach his excellencies, to show his glory. Like you are called to preach the gospel. Now, as, as an overseer and pastor, do they have other responsibilities besides what I am doing right now? Absolutely, a whole bunch of them. However, Scripture shows that if you claim to follow Jesus, you are claiming to be a missionary, to be on that mission, to be intentionally working in, within your relationships that you have to establish new relationships. We got into this a lot at City Group on Thursday. Like, that's what we're called to. Like, we are called to create relationships to be a missionary, just because you don't have a title with your name, just because it's not, oh, that's Pastor Emily, like doesn't mean you don't have the responsibility that every single one of us who claim to follow Jesus have. You are called to be a light in the darkness. You are called to be a city on a hill. You are a royal priesthood. Every single one of us. Now, Remember, Luke says here that the apostle said, choose seven from among you. Here's what didn't happen. They didn't go down to the seminary and go, hey, we need seven volunteers. Because I'll tell you, as someone who went through seminary, if a, a, a church would have at any time came into a seminary class and been like, hey, we need seven people, you're not going to have a problem filling those roles. You have literally a class of, you know, 40, 50 kids who are kids. I wasn't a kid, but like 40, 50 students who are literally sitting here going, hey, I am studying and I am paying money so that I could transition into doing this. But what Luke says here is the apostle said, pick seven from among you. See, the church, we're called to raise up leaders for future churches, in other words, we are called to plant other churches. And I know for most of us in this room, we're looking around going, hey, I don't think we should be talking about planting other churches right now. I think we should just be talking about growing the church we're in, right? 
Like some of you guys are like looking around going, there's a lot of empty seats in here. However, I'm telling you, this is what Christ has called us to. I'm not asking, do I think in my natural way of thinking that this is a good idea? I'm sitting here telling us, no, Scripture calls us to this, to raise up people from in here. These are the people that have suffered with you. These are the people that have rejoiced with you. These are the people that have been there time and time again. These are the people you have ate with. These are the people you text with. Like, these are the people who are involved in your life. These are the people that make up the church. And let's see how many of their names we know, okay? Like, these are the seven that the church decided these are the people we want to, to put into this role of serving in this function. You ready? So in verse 5, it says this. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, not Timon and Pumbaa, it's a different one, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. First miracle you should have seen in that. Did everybody catch the line, and this pleased everyone? Do you have any idea how hard it is to please a group of people? Like Abraham Lincoln, oh, well, that's fooling a group of people. But anyway, I'll give you this illustration. There's five of us in, our fa- in my family, right? So it's me, Debbie, and then JT, Kayla, Gabby. Just trying to go out to eat will not please five people, okay? At least one of us is going to have a problem with where someone picks, little secret, it's mostly going to be Debbie because we're, we're good with Sonic, okay? But, but this is saying that it pleased everyone. Now, as we read through that list, how many of those names were you automatically like, oh, yeah, Nicholas, the proselyte from Antioch. Like, I remember him. Like, he did great things, right? Some scholars argue that he's the one that the Nicolaitans were founded from. You guys remember the Nicolaitans, right? In the book of Revelation, like we talked about them, like, no? See, how many of these people do we actually remember? Most of us, or, or at least some of us, I'm sure, when I read Stephen, you were like, yep, first one, I'm out the gate, like, good. Like, it was like when you're taking that test and that first question's real easy because it just says name, and you're like, I got this. You get 400 points just for signing this, right? And then we said Philip, and you were like, yeah, 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 Philip and the eunuch, it's different Philip. Same name, different guy. So I go, okay, out of this list of seven, we all got one. Like, we remember Stephen. He's the guy that, you know, is going to be with us for the rest of this chapter, and next chapter is dead. We don't know any of the other ones, do we? Like, we're all sitting here going, like, "Mm, I wanted to. See, these were men. These were men that that were fine with not being the center of attention. Is that us? Like, as, as we really stop and think about it, and I know most of us have that, that false humility, right? Most of us are, oh, no, 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 don't tell them it was from me. Secretly, though, in the back of your mind, you're like, please let them know it was from me, okay? This is a $100 gift card. I want to make sure I get the credit for it, but I can't come out t- to you and say, hey, can you give me the credit for it, okay? Because that's just wrong, right? So we have that false humility, But these were men that went, no, you know what, seriously, if this is the only time I'm mentioned in the Bible, I'm good. And for everybody in the room, you're like, if I could have gotten the Bible one time, I'd have been good too. However, these are men that weren't up on the stage. Like, these weren't, like, the faces of the churches. Like, if I started naming, like, famous, you know, quote-unquote pastors, most of you would be able to immediately see their face, right? Right? Like, if I said, like, I don't know, Joel Osteen, most of you would be able to, whether you like him or not, good, bad, wrong, indifferent, doesn't really matter. He is a false teacher, though. You, but you see his face. Like, you, you know who he is. If I were to say Benny Hinn, I know some of you in this room grew up in his church. Like, you would know who he is, right? But if I go Nicholas, the Antioch, or the proselyte of Antioch, most of us don't, right? If I went Joby Martin. I mean, I know there's like four of us in here that would be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what he looks like. I know there's one of us in here that goes, I don't know what he looks like, but I know what he sounds like, and that's all I want to know. (laughs) 
See, how many of us are good taking a back seat to the gospel? How many of us are good going, hey, I'm going to serve in this role that, that I'm not going to get any face time, that no one's, not, no one's even going to know that I was involved with that. Like, I'm not going to get any of the credit for it. See, I try to spend the majority of my time going, don't look at me, because I'm going to fail you, I'm going to disappoint you, I'm going to let you down. But look to Jesus. See, because that's what we all should be doing. Like, anytime we, we, we think, like, and Paul would word it like this, that we are more haughty than what we should be. Well, the Bible would teach us one thing, right? Pride comes when? Before the fall. See, these were people that just like every person sitting in this room tonight, these were just normal, everyday people. Remember when we were back in Acts chapter 4 and I told you like the, the Sadducees and, and they were like arguing with uh, Peter and John and they were astonished because they were common men. See, the problem I have with movies like the Ten Commandments, or, or David and Goliath, or even the Bible miniseries, is it gives us the opportunity, and I like the Bible miniseries, I'm not, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it gives us the opportunity to look at David more than what David was, because it gives us the opportunity to go, oh, David, he's the one that killed the giant, right? Like, he's an amazing man of God, who am I? Like, I've never stood down Goliath. I've never, you know, got that opportunity to stand up and go, oh, yeah, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like, I've never had those opportunities. So I must be a second-tiered Christian. Like, I'm just someone who is faithful, someone who shows up week after week. Like, that, that, that must be all I am. You know, some of us probably sit here a lot and go, how do I fit into this? Like, what do I bring to the table? Like, what good is it that I am part of this body? Like, what purpose do I have in any of this? Like, I, I, I see what everybody else does, but, but I'm kind of just sitting here. See, some of us, we, we tend to over-celebrate these, these flawed individuals and we kind of take our eyes off of the Christ because we start worrying about well well where do I go what do I do see these men they love Jesus and when it came time to serve they just jump right in they didn't go oh I got to think about this can you give me a couple of weeks like, can I pray about this? Can I, can I, well, well, what about this? Like, well, is there going to be a change in my title? Oh, is so-and-so still going to be doing this? Like, they went, in order to fulfill all of the different one another's. Now, now, and, and be honest, raise your hand if, and when I say all the one another's, if you're like, what are you talking about? Because I'll explain it real quick. All right. Jesus gives us, you shall love one another. You shall keep my commandments by serving one another. And if you read through the Gospels, you keep seeing this term, one another. And Jesus is going, hey, you want to follow me? Then you need to do for one another what I am doing for you. And these men went, in order for us to really fulfill these one another's, then I have to have a role in this. In other words, you are not called to be a spectator in this. You are not called to be a consumer in this. When we stand up to sing, you are called to stand and make a joyful noise to the Lord. I'll tell you right now, and I've told Josh to his face, I don't like to sing. I don't like songs. I don't like, like, I don't get into it the way he does. But you know what I do every time? I sing. Like, I'm not just standing here going, watermelon, 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 watermelon. Like, I follow, the words are on screen. We're called to be a participant in this. Seriously, it's why I do ask questions. I expect you to be able to respond to it. I expect this to be more of a kind of dialogue than it is a monologue. 
Because I know, not just as a pastor, but as a teacher, that if I want you to be able to take away from what I'm saying, you have to be involved in with what I'm saying. That if you're just sitting here staring, you're only going to remember about 4% of what I say. And chances are it's going to be a stupid joke that I said that actually caught your attention. So you're not even going to remember the good parts of it. You're going to remember, like, the stupid things I say. See, this is not a spectator sport. This is a war that we are involved in. And, and for the life of me, I cannot whatever, like, recall to memory, but Ephesians 6 says that our battle isn't with flesh and blood. Like, I'm not, like, like again, guys, Roe v. Wade got overturned. Okay, the, 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 the gun rights in New York got overturned. There are a lot of people you know, a lot of people that you would call friends that are very, very, very upset, angry, and hateful right now to you simply because you believe in Jesus. They have no idea where you stand on any of this stuff, but they know you believe in Jesus and they are hateful and mad at you. We are called to war. We are called to enter into those things, not to just stand on the sideline and go, but that's what we do because we're afraid to offend people, because we're afraid to lose friends, because we're afraid to fight with each other because we don't like conflict, because we're afraid to talk to someone for a million different reasons. But see, we're called to more than that. And these men knew that. These men knew that in order to be part of the body, they actually have to be connected to the body and serving a role within the body. Okay? Let me explain that in, in a medical way. I am aging, and as much as I hate aging, one of the biggest reminders that I am aging is every morning when I wake up and I brush my teeth and I notice that the skin right here is starting to show a little more every day. Give you a fishing analogy. Sandbars. <laughs> I'm not going to go with that one. But see, the hairs that are falling out, you know what they are? They're dead. There's no life in them anymore. They can't, the root can't hold on to the follicle anymore, so it lets it go because it's going, we're not giving you nourishment anymore. And one day, sooner than what I thought, there's going to be nothing up here anymore. So when I start preaching from with a hat, just understand, it's not a yarmulke. I'm just trying to cover it up. See, but... In order for it to be part of my body, it has to be alive and it has to be working with my body to keep my body alive. And these men knew that. These men knew in order for me to be a part of this thing that I call the church, in order for me to be a part of that body, there is a role that I serve, that only I can serve, and that keeps other people from having to serve in my role. And that's huge. Give you a sports analogy now. I played running back for years, and I was pretty good at it. But you know, if I didn't have an offensive line, I would not have been good at that. Like, these were guys that seriously, okay, any football fans in here? Name any running back, any NFL running back. Marshawn Lynch. Is he, does he even play anymore? Okay. I was going to go with Emmett Smith. <laughs> JT, go. Name a running back. Derrick Henry. Deion Sanders is not playing. He retired when I was your age. Now, that being said, though, we saw how hard that was with a running back, right? And these are people that get the glory. Like, these are people that are actually talked about on Sports Center because these are the people that get the touchdowns. Like, these are the people that do those big, amazing things that highlight reels are made of. Anyone in here want to name me an, a, an offensive lineman? Was it Jeff Fain? Good job. And I only knew that because I went to school with him. Anyone else got another one? See, again, we can't name those because they don't get the glory. 
And for those of you that are like, oh, I don't know what an offensive lineman is. If you ever watch football, they're the like eight foot tall, 400 pounders that are just like doing all the hard work. They're the ones that their knees get blown out because they literally are colliding with other 400 pounders just time after time after time. They don't get the glory. But do you know Emmett Smith, who is a Hall of Fame running back, if he didn't have an offensive line, you wouldn't know his name either? You would have no idea who Troy Aikman was. You would have no idea who Marshawn Lynch or any Derrick Henry. Sorry, I stopped watching football back in the 90s, so I can only name 90s football <laughs> players. You wouldn't know who any of those people were. Like if we went to war with a country and the only person that showed up was a mechanic... Do you think he's going to win that battle? Probably not, right? See, and, and these men knew that. They knew in order for the widows to be cared for, they needed to step up and care for them. Like, it's crazy. It's called personal responsibility, and I know it's lost in especially my generation. Like, it's my job to do this, and if I don't do this, no one else is going to. Like, that's crazy, Right? But we need that in the church for the church to function. In other words, I'm not saying I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to believe. I believe, so I will do. That's what having faith is all about. Having faith isn't saying I believe. It's saying that I have something to do, so I'm going to do it. Faith is saying I don't come to church to be fed. I come to church so that I can feed others. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why I go, this isn't a consumer thing. This isn't something that you just get to sit and be a part of. This is something that Jesus is going, hey, look, I gave you this gift for a reason. Use it to make much of me. And that's what these men are doing. So how many of us are like these men? How many of us are stepping into the roles that God has placed in front of us? How many of us are sitting here going, you know what? Here I am, Lord, send me. I don't know what that looks like, but God, I'm willing to do it. I would much rather your time than your money any day of the week. We're very, very frugal as a con uh, congregation. In other words, we could, me and Debbie could pay for everything out of pocket. That's why, like, I'm not killing it on tithes and offerings. Like, I don't even get a paycheck. I go, but I don't care about your money. Give me your time. Like, be ready to serve. Like, go, hey, I have some great ideas. Let's go do these things. Like, that is important. Money's easy. It's very easy for all of you right now to just pull out your phone. You can even go to our app and go, here, I can give you money. What kind of investment is that? It's very hard on the flip side of that, though. You know what? But I'm going to be committed to Thursday nights at Citigroup. I'm going to be committed to every Saturday at service because I am committed to the church because I am the church. I am part of this thing, and I have a role to fill. How many of us can think back over our, this past week, just this past week, and go, here is one thing I did because I love God with everything I am and I love others the way that I love me. How many of us have one thing that we did? If you want to answer it. <laughs> yes, it is a real question. Like, how many of us can say, here's how I pushed into the darkness over the past week? Like, here's how I fought back the enemy. Here's how I went to the gates of hell and I went, hey, Jesus already told me you ain't going to prevail, so I'm just going to knock you down myself. Like, how many of us have one thing that we did? How many of us, if we're in this position, crap, would be nominated for that position. Like if I came in tonight and I was like, hey guys, pick amongst yourself five people. How many of us are like, oh yeah, I'd get that nomination. And I don't mean that in a, in a prideful way. JT, you can put your hand down. <laughs> but like how many of us, how many of us would be willing to put in the work to gain those positions? 
And how many of us are like, no, I'm cool just riding this thing out? See, and it does end with what happens when the church is the church and people step into those roles. In verse 7, it continues with this. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. How bad is your message that when you're not just getting like common people, but you're going to like the priest, and they're going, you know what? You're absolutely right. I want to come be a part of that. Like, just to put it into modern day terms, okay, this would be like if an imam walked in right now and converted me to Islam. Like, that's what they're talking about here. And what are we afraid of? Because understand, these are the same people that killed Jesus because he was preaching the message. And now they're sitting here going, "Uh uh-oh, I believe in what you're saying. What you're saying is true. And what happens? They multiply, they grow, and they explode. That's what happens. See, when we step into our roles and we serve in the roles that God has called us into, what happens? We multiply. You want to talk about growing the church? Start growing. You start growing personally in your role and watch how we grow naturally as an overflow of that. Like we don't need to pay marketing companies to come in and, and pay all of this money to do some fancy marketing on social media. All we need to do is hit share. Like we don't need to do anything but what God's already called us to. So we looked at 1 Corinthians 12 in light of this, right? And an eye can't say I am better than a foot because they do very different things. And it's still true, right? Would you rather have your eyes or your feet? Or both? No one in here going, I'm picking eyes, right? We're all like, no, I want both of them. Thank you. See, every one of us that follow Christ have a role to play in that. You are something in the body. Some of us may be hands. Some of us may be feet. Some of us may be mouths. Some of us in this room are an armpit. Some of us, hey, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, are hemorrhoids. And we are here to be a pain in the enemy's butt. Be proud to be a hemorrhoid. There you go, JT. You can't do stuff like that when I'm up here, buddy, because no one else can see you. (laughs) That one threw me, JT. I've never seen it. I didn't even get an amen on screen for that one, bud. See, some of us, our roles, (laughs) he was happy back there, though. Some of us, our role, your role in the future is to do exactly what I'm doing right now is to stand in front of a room and preach the gospel to people. Your goal or your role is to be an example for the people that are listening to you to follow. Some of you, that's your future. Some of you, your roles are to sing. Josh is always talking about how he needs more musicians. Some of you, that's your role. Get up there, play guitar. What else do you need? Drums, something else. Clarinet. I'll tell you right now, he ain't even picky. JT did ask him, if I brought my clarinet, would you let me play? And he was like, yeah. If you can play the song, have at it. As you did not hear, we did not have a clarinet up on stage, did we? Because it sounds like a cat dying. Bring your recorder. You did better with that. Hot cross buns it is. See, some of us, our role is making people feel welcome when they pull in. Is making people feel welcome when, when we have city groups, when we gather, when we come together. Some of us, our role is caring for someone. Some of us, our role in this is going, hey, look, I'm going to send a text because so-and-so needs to know that someone cares. Some of us, our roles are preparing and, and, and breaking down, are cleaning and, and making happen, are planning and, and going, hey, this is what we're going to do. Like, see, no one's going to see you do that, though. You're, you're not going to get, like, people aren't going to stand up and, go, like, like, y'all heard when, like, Josh got done with Glorious Day and everyone started clapping, right? That's not going to happen for everybody. 
Like for some of us, we're just going to finish and we're just going to fade off. We're going to be one of these seven men that no one can name. However, do you think they had an impact on their body? Do you think that there are widows that were sitting here going, oh my God, I could not do this without you? Yeah. See, the list could keep going and going and going, but the bottom line is, is if one of us bucks our role and we don't serve in the capacity of our role, you hurt every single other person in here because someone has to step up into that role that was created for you. Someone has to step up into that role and go, okay, I have to do this role as well. And let's be honest, they may not be gifted like you are. I'll tell you right now, like I can make graphics, but not like Emily can. And I can guarantee it's gonna take me a lot longer like to make something like that than it would take Emily. And Emily's probably looking at that right now going, ah, I would have used this font, I would have done this, I would have done that. But what I'm saying is, and she didn't even know I needed a graphic, okay? I'm not like picking on Emily. I was listening to how this is going to come out. But what I'm saying is, is when you don't serve in your role, you hurt everyone else because someone's got to. And when we all serve in our roles, what happens? And the word of God increased and the disciples multiplied greatly. We want to see growth? Sit there and go, what mission am I on? Sit here and go, this is where I fit in to this body. I, it just hit me. I'm a knee. Everything hinges on me. <laughs> you fit somewhere. Remember last week we were talking about the intestine. Right? Everyone was like, I never thought I could be an intestine before, but without them, you're going to die. See, Paul would word it like this in Romans 10. And I'm going to close with this. So as the musical Im uh, ambassadors, my bad, the musically inclined people make their way back up. <laughs> Paul would ask in Romans 10, 14, and it's the same thing I'm going to ask each and every one of us. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching. See, when we fail to do our part, everyone suffers. Everyone suffers. But when the church is the church, we explode and the disciples multiply greatly. So you may be sitting here going, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not called to preach. First of all, you are called to preach. I've already made that very clear. Second of all, even if you're someone who's like, hey, but could I be like a second or third string preacher? Cool. You fill another role that I don't have to, and I'll preach more. I'm good with that. See, we all have that role. So as we close, think about it again. What is God calling you to? How are you fulfilling what God is calling you to? And what more should slash could you be doing to what God has called you to. So Father, I ask and I pray that as we sit here tonight and marinate on these things, that God, our goal being that your name is made much of and people are brought to know you, that God, you place inside of us those desires and passions that we're gonna chase down so that God, we can make more of you. So Father, we ask and we pray that God, you lay that on us. That one area, God, that we've been sitting there toying with in the back of our mind going, one day, one day I'm going to do this. And God, you just fan into that, that little spark in our mind. And God, make it a fire that is uncontrollable. Father, we ask and we pray. We want to see you glorified in all we do. And we know a natural outpouring of that is that we will grow and multiply greatly. So, Father, make us fall more in love with you. Give us a passion for you. And, God, out of the abundance of that, the mouth will speak. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.